Also sie ist Umweltschützerin, Bürgerrechtlerin und äh, Feministin und hat 1993 den alternativen Nobelpreis bekommen für ihr Zusammendenken von Ökologie und Feminismus. Sie ist Vorsitzende des äh, International Forum on Globalization. Sie ist äh, Mitglied im Club of Rome und im äh, Exekutivkomitee des Weltzukunftsrates äh, und ist hierzulande wahrscheinlich äh, hauptsächlich bekannt für ihr Engagement gegen Gentechnik, Biopiraterie und die üblen Machenschaften transnationaler Konzerne. We are very happy to have you here. Begrüßt mit mir Vandana Shiva. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be back in Berlin. We were just remembering Barbara and I, uh, the amazing uh, programs and movements that were organized in 1988 when there was still a wall. And I remember we talked about how walls like that should not exist. And today we live in a Berlin without walls and there are many more walls to be taken down. And I think one of the biggest walls that needs to come down is the wall of illusions. Illusions like growth. Illusions that tell us that the more money that moves in the economy and society, the better off we are. And I think the reason so many of you are here today, you're catching on that that's an illusion and you want to build another reality. All that economic growth measures is the flow of money. It doesn't work out how the money is created. It doesn't work out in what direction the money flows. I was trained as a physicist, and one of the first things you learn in physics is the vector. What direction? Is it going to destroy nature or build nature? Is it going to destroy society or build community? The vector is missing in the economic growth indicators, as is the actual state of affairs. That's the other thing we learn in physics, that things have states. In quantum mechanics, you have quantum states. In classical mechanics, you have classical states, but still the indicators that tell you what is where and how it's behaving. Economic growth indicators tell you nothing. They just give you an anonymous figure. And on that basis, We're supposed to bow down to that indicator and let our lives be wiped out, let the planet's life be wiped out. One reason why we can't trust these indicators is because money itself has become an unreliable measure of the economy. It was anyway never intended to reflect the actual value of things. It was supposed to be a means And that's why our banknotes say, I promise to pay the bearer. It was just a promise. It was merely a means of accessing resources. But today it's even lost that mooring in real resources. Money can make itself and multiply itself like a virus. Look at how it multiplied itself over the value of subprime real estate in the United States and brought the entire world economy down. The subprime crisis was based on new instruments that have been created to make multi money multiply itself. You give one unre unreliable loan, you get 25% interest out of that, you bundle it up, out of that securitization you get much more, out of derivatives, collateral debt obligations, You get further and further removed from reality. And I remember Einstein said something, he said, a symptom of insanity is to keep doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different outcome. So when these... <laughs> when these collateral debt obligations started to go wrong, they squared it. And they said CDO squared. When that went wrong, they cubed it. And they would have put it to the power of four if Wall Street hadn't come down in the middle. 
Second reason why we have to question economic growth and go beyond growth is because the increased flow of money is increasingly taking place at the cost of nature and people. A living forest doesn't contribute to economic growth, it contributes to life. And the first movement I was very privileged and honored to be part of was the famous Chipko movement, which fought against commercial forestry, which contributed to growth. Every tree cut, registered in the market, and it contributed to growth. Every living tree contributed to life. And the women of my region came out and said, we are going to hug the trees. You can't cut the trees till you kill us. In 1981, we got a logging ban in the source of the Ganges River, in the high altitude mountains of where our mighty river start, because the women's wisdom that the most important function of the trees is stabilizing flows of soil and water, that that's the economy of nature, the real oikos, the real household, in which growth must take place. Not chopping down trees and having this much square foot of timber traded, this much royalty is collected out of destruction of forests into dead timber. The interesting thing is, governments are now, as was said in the introduction, revisiting the idea of growth. I remember my dear friend and sister, Marilyn Waring, wrote a fat book called If Women Mattered. And she had be become the youngest MP in New Zealand and had been very important in making New Zealand a nuclear-free zone. She was very puzzled that every time she went to parliament to ask for more money for childcare or mon more money for welfare, she would be told there's no money. And every time there was a defense budget, there was always money. So she decided to investigate where do these growth figures come from? Where does this gross national product and gross domestic product assessment come from? And she realized, she went back to the United Nations system of account keeping and found out that it was a very artificial construction to mobilize money for the wars. And the definition of growth was, if you produce what you consume, then you don't produce. Since nature recycles everything and therefore produces what she consumes, she doesn't produce. All of the sustenance economies of the third world, of the household, women, we produce and we consume. That doesn't count. So the real economy of nature and people is turned into a zero in the very definition of GNP and GDP. The, you know, Aristotle actually distinguished between two economies. He called one krimastistics, related to money making, and he called the other oikonomia, related to the maintenance of life. And that's the real issue. What economic growth is promoting is extremely efficient ways of money making by a few, at the cost of the lives of people, lives of community, lives of the planet. And that is why we have to go beyond it. India stands out as such a conspicuous example in this growth debate. China and India are the two countries that are always cited these days. And I say these days because in the decade of the 90s, we used to be told in India, we've got to be like the tigers and the dragons of Southeast Asia. In 1997, their economies collapsed. And growth needs poster children. The giant countries of Asia, China, and India have become the new poster children of growth. But we'll go the same way because we are being asked to predate on the very things that support us, nature's economy and the sustenance economy. So India has 9% growth. But what's growing? Are people better off? Are our ecosystems healthier? No. You can look at every sector. You can look at land and you can look at biodiversity. And you can look at food. You can look at water. And let me tell you a few stories of how exactly the 9% growth that makes India a shining India 
is rooted in the destruction of the very foundation of our civilization that has stood the test of time for more than 10,000 years. One of the arguments repeatedly used is the reason we need high growth rates is growth will lead to poverty removal. And a very simple metaphor is used. If you don't have growth, the cake won't go bigger. If the cake is not bigger, the poor won't have a bigger share. But economic growth is stealing the cake of the poor. In fact, it's stealing the bread of the poor. In the few days before leaving home, I've been busy with supporting farmers across India who are defending their land. On the 9th of May, just outside Delhi, farmers who were protesting the land grab and land wars were shot at. According to the farmers, more than 70 people have been killed. According to the government, four people have been killed. There is not an investigation yet to confirm ex what exactly is the number. But homes were burned. 5,000 police surrounded this group of villagers. And like I mentioned, this is just outside Delhi. In the name of building an expressway, five new mega townships are being built. One of these townships is a sports city. And the Formula One track is being built on it. That's what got the farmers really angry. The farmers had been paid 300 rupees for the land by the government, which appropriates the land on behalf of private interests. The private interests sell off that same land at six, when I say 300 rupees, it's for a square meter, the dimension of this table. That's what the farmers got. The big business sells it off, the speculators sell it off at 600,000 rupees, the same land. Just moves from one hand to the other. That's a 200,000% increase in growth in the money economy. So if you're only looking at that, of course more money is flowing. There are more billionaires being created. And a hundred of the new billionaires of India now control one third of India's economy. If they are allowed to keep grabbing the land and water of the people, they'll control two thirds of the economy. But what happens to the people? They're left without land, without livelihood, without food, without a future. A million young men are unemployed in this area, and in the first few days when they get the money for compensation, they have a few drinks, they get a few more bikes, they run around, and then it's over, and they are un unemployed. And beyond a point, as an unemployed person, what do you turn to for a living? Crime. Crime contributes to growth hugely, but does, does it create healthy societies? The other area is where a mega steel plant is being created. It's supposed to be a Korean company. We did the analysis. It's not Korean at all. It's owned by Wall Street now, since the privatization of Korea's assets. The farmers will lose 4 million rupees an acre because of very prosperous farming. It doesn't count in the national accounts because they grow the beetle leaf. A beetle, uh, you know, it's called the pan, which Indians use as a digestive. It's not in the international trading system. The company itself, it's supposed to be the biggest investment in India, $12 billion. In eight years out of mining alone, they'll have recovered this. They have a captive mine, a captive port, a captive power plant. This growth economy is an economy of captivity. And the place we see this most dramatically is in the field of agriculture. I was introduced as a person who deals with GMOs. Let me tell you the story of growth in the seed sector. India is the land of cotton. Gandhi spun cotton for our freedom. He brought out the spinning wheel and said, let's make khadi. So for us, cotton is a fiber of freedom. But today, it has become a fiber of slavery. Monsanto entered India in 97, 98 with its GM cotton. It entered illegally. I had to file a case in our Supreme Court. They were stopped from selling the commercially their seeds, and it took them four years to get the appropriate approvals. When they did, 
the cost of seed went up from five to 10 rupees a kilogram to 8,000% 8, higher, more than 4,000 rupees a kilogram. 10 billion rupees was what Monsanto was extracting annually in terms of royalty payments. That's a lot of growth, but it's growth for Monsanto. What does it do to the farmer who gets trapped in non-renewable GM seeds that have intellectual property patent protection? The first thing is, seed must give rise to seed. That's the nature of seed. So there's a lot of growth when seed becomes seed because seed multiplies, seed gets rejuvenated, seed is distributed. But non-renewable seed doesn't allow seed to go to seed. You have to buy seed every year. So in nature, there's a new scarcity created, but for Monsanto, there's a new multiplication of profits created. When Monsanto extracts 8,000% increase in seed costs, and the seed itself is not pest control technology, one of the biggest myths of genetic engineering is that it increases the production of food and we must have it in order to remove hunger. In fact, there is not a single case in which genetic engineering has led to an increase in a crop. Our native seeds are producing more because we do seed saving in Navdanya, the movement has started, and we've just collected field data. Monsanto's average is 500 kilograms an acre, and farmers growing native seeds organically are harvesting 900 to 1,000 kilograms an acre. Farmers have to buy pesticides. This new pests that have been created, the bollworm has become resistant. They're now bringing a second Bt gene into the crop called Bolgard 2. The result of it means debt for farmers. And farmers cannot pay that debt back because with cotton is associated a $4 billion subsidy in the US, which then dumps cotton on an international market and WTO failed in Cancun because of the cotton issue. Farmers know very soon that they can never pay this debt back and the advertisements that told them either that they would be millionaires or that there was white gold being sent from heaven above using our divinities and gods as sales agents Within a year or two, farmers are trapped in unpayable debt, and 250,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide in the last decade as seed has got controlled. 60 Indian companies that used to sell cotton seed are now controlled by Monsanto through licensing arrangements. Worldwide, Monsanto is running very fast to acquire seed companies. Seminus, the biggest seed company for vegetables, has been bought up. Just day before the no patents on seed movement sent out a circular saying the melon, which has been bred conventionally using Indian melon strains that are resistant to a virus, have now been patented by Monsanto. Every patent means growth in the profits of Monsanto. Every patent means the growth of debt for the farmer, the growth of suicides, but that never shows up in the economic growth figures. The same is the case for food. The figures were mentioned, a billion people without food worldwide. But the sad thing is another two billion people who are eating are suffering from diseases related to food, obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Because what we are eating now is no more food. I call it anti-food. Because it's doing the opposite to our body from what food should be doing. Food should be nourishing us. This food is killing us. Now, first the companies make money selling us junk food, anti-food. Then people fall ill. They make money. It's the same companies that sell the food. Same companies sell the medicine. Then they make money through the treatment. There's no limit to the profits. There's no limits to the growth. But there's a huge limit to the people's lives. We used to grow and eat 8,500 plant species. Now only eight are traded globally. Only eight. 
and most of them are corn, soya, canola, cotton, because that's where the royalties and patents are associated. The result of this has been that in the last decade and a half of globalization and trade liberalization, India has gone from a food self-reliant country to a country of hunger. Our per capita consumption of food has dropped from 171 kilograms per capita per year to less than 150 kilograms per capita per year. We have a report done by Navdanya, why is every fourth Indian hungry, analyzing the roots of this new hunger. Every third Indian woman is today so desperately malnourished that she loses. She either dies herself or her baby dies. And if the baby survives, 43% of Indian children, which is half of the world's severely malnourished children, are so deprived of food that they are what is called wasted. Wasted means you'll never grow up to be fully functional mentally or physically. So growth is taking place in terms of having reduced food to a commodity. In the markets, it's wonderful. Dosha Bank had an advertisement. Do you like the prices of food going up? Then come and invest in the Euro Food Fund because now food is a subject of speculation like the real estate was in America. But for people, it means hunger. And if you remember, in the first few days of both the Tunisian as well as the Egyptian uh, movement, it was the price of food that was at the heart. People were showing bread in terms of why they were angry and why they were discontented. Water, uh, Coca-Cola was mining 1.5 lit million liters a day in a village called Plachimada. Huge growth. They take that water for free, put it into a bottle, put manufactured by Coca-Cola, as if they create water on this planet, and then they sell it to you for 12 rupees. Lots of growth. It, but it meant the wells of the women went empty. They were walking 10 miles. And my lama, who passed away two years ago, said, why should we walk further? This company should close. It took a very strong women's movement, but eventually that plant was shut down. Growth stopped, but the water came back. <laughs> but there are two other reasons why we need to move beyond growth, beyond the fact that it is an illusion. Today, growth can only grow at the cost of democracy. It can only grow by destroying free societies. In Europe, it means by dismantling the welfare system. It means putting structural adjustment first, putting the recovery of banks first, letting people's jobs, welfare, education, health go to the dogs. And we're seeing that in the four countries under structural adjustment in Europe. Greece, Portugal, Spain, where there are protests right now, and Ireland. Remember, Ireland was the roaring tiger on the growth model. Look where growth brought it. But it isn't just democracy that is being destroyed. Growth today in our parts of the world is coming through the barrel of a gun. And we can't afford this. We can't afford the militarization of our societies. We can't afford our farmers and tribals to be killed just because there's huge money to be made out of mining of bauxite for aluminum and iron ore for steel and all the rare metals that go into everything we touch. Growth today is mining our future. And that is why not only are we as citizens saying we'll go beyond growth and we are smart enough to shape a society beyond growth and live better in the process. A country, tiny country in my part of the world, Bhutan, years ago said gross national product and gross domestic product are mismeasures of the economy we will treat 
gross national happiness as our objective and end of society. And they're doing it. The Prime Minister has invited me to help Bhutan go 100% organic. 100% organic means less, zero sales of chemicals, growth will come down. No GMOs, growth will come down. But farmers will be more prosperous, the ecosystems will be healthier, biodiversity will flourish, rivers will fill, flow clean. We have two options. We have two options before us. Either to recognize that there are limits of the earth, that we are part of the earth and build earth community and earth democracy, or allow the total devastation of this planet and with the devastation of the planet and extinction of the human species with very fast growth. The only thing the growth model is leading us to is our own extinction. No other species has been stupid enough to do that. Surely the human species should rise with higher intelligence and higher emotions, love and values. And I know we can do it. This dinosaur of a false model must collapse. Let's show the way before it causes too much destruction. Thank you.